Today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, you have your Bibles, turn there. We're going to begin in verse 21, and we are on the last two chapters of a series that uh, we are calling Blueprint. Basically, we're learning how to make the best of what God has given us. Uh, And today, the main portion of scripture that we're looking at has to do with marriage. So would you say that word with me? Say marriage. Marriage. Awesome. So um, we're going to begin in verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. This is what the Bible says. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Let me just put a little breaker here. Anytime that I have heard this passage preach, usually they ignore verse 21. And I don't know why it is, but they, the very first verse that we began with, they don't usually include. And usually the emphasis is on the wife submitting to the husband. That's usually, and I don't know about, maybe your experience is a little bit different than mine, but every time that I've heard this passage being preached, the emphasis is verse 22 and forth, like the wife submitting to the husband. But if you look at the whole thing, if, if, like if we're going to look at the, the entire, the whole counsel of God's word, you've got to include verse 21. You can't get away with, with uh, excluding it, right? And so I think that according to God's word, the command here is mutual submission. All right? So God says, verse 21, one more time, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, And then God speaks directly to the wife. Then he speaks directly to the husband. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We're going to stop there today. Um, The rest of the verses, especially verse 31 and 32, where it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and you know the rest of the verse. We're going to look at that next week, okay? So next week, here, 9, 30, 11, we're going to talk about dating, how to biblically guide your mind, heart, and body. It's actually, what I'm teaching you next week here on Sunday is what I'm going to be teaching the students tonight at 5 o'clock. I'm teaching on dating tonight to our students, something that God put in my heart about a year and a half ago. Um, If you have a middle schooler, if you have a high schooler, okay, I cannot emphasize enough to you, okay, the importance of being, making sure your students are here at 5 p.m., and we're going to be here from 5 to 6.30. We're starting something new for our students every other week. We call it Deep Dive and so I hope, uh, if you know, if maybe you, your kids are grown, but you know somebody else that could benefit, I'm, I'm just begging you, okay? This is not something, this is something that I, uh, for two years God's put in my heart, and it is content that our students, young people, need to hear. Now, I'll be honest with you, I was reviewing the information, and it is so good. It's stuff that has helped me so much ever since I was in college that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn around and teach it to you next week, Okay? So that is tonight. I hope you can help me with that. Um, The title of our message today is this, Seven Reminders to Help You Love Your Spouse. Seven Reminders to Help You Love Your Spouse. Let me me give you a disclaimer, okay? Um, These are reminders. These are things that I'm learning. These are things that I picked up from other teachers, other communicators. Um, I have not arrived Okay, uh, like this is not like uh, like each one of these points, you know, they're so convicting to me personally. And so uh, I hope that I hope that you um, it's seven points. Okay, usually uh, my if you're new to the, to our church, you know, usually I give like my mes- most messages are like three points by thirty minute message. Um, if I have a fourth point, we go forty minutes. Well, today 
today, seven reminders, all right? So <laughs> fasten your seatbelts. We're going to go fast. But it's really, I really believe this is, and I think I have confidence to say this because it's stuff that, not that I've created, but I've learned. And so if you're not a note taker, I really encourage you, take some notes because you're going to need the reminder, okay? And uh, the, the subject is submitting to one another. Now, if you're here and you're not married, Okay, let me tell you this. Each one of these seven principles is transferable. Okay, so all you have to do is substitute the word spouse with the word friend or the or co-worker or family member. Okay, and I'll let you do that on your own. But every single one of the seven principles is stuff that you can apply to your life even if you're not married. Okay, let's begin with the word of prayer and we'll get into it. Father God, I ask that you would help me right now not to mess this up. Lord, you know my heart, you know my imperfections. And so, God, I, I come to you today as a student of your word, as someone that wants to grow, as someone who's just not willing to give up. And so, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds. God, I pray that there will be um, a truth that's spoken today that will be so convicting that would change our lives. And God, we dedicate to you the next 20 minutes we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, the first reminder, seven reminders is this. Write this down if you can. Take a picture of the screen, that's fine. Uh, it's this. You have no idea how one conversation, one word of encouragement, one expression of love might change your spouse's day. Now, that could be a friend's day. It could be a co-worker's. You fill in the blank, and I'll, I'll let you do that the rest of the message, okay? One conversation. That's all it takes. One expression of love. One word of encouragement. So about two and a half weeks ago, I was listening to this neuroscientist, and um, it was incredible what he was saying. He's this guy from Argentina, world-renowned doctor, leader, a very smart individual. His name is Facundo Manus. He has a PhD from Cambridge. And uh, he was doing sort of like a, <clears throat> a TED Talk. Okay, and I say sort of because it was in Europe. It was actually in Spain, and it was not a TED Talk, but it was the same format. He was speaking to a younger crowd. And, um, and he, the, the, the subject, the name of his, talk, of his talk was Know Your Brain in Order to Live Better. Know Your Brain in Order to Live Better. I don't even know if the guy is a believer or not, but to me, it was fascinating. The content, just looking at it from a scientific point of view, it was incredible. And so what he said is that there are, that neuroscience has this, discovered this thing and they can pretty much predict whether a team is going to be successful or not. They have said, and when they talk about a team, they're talking about any group of people, right? It could be a team at work. It could be a marriage, a couple of people. It could be basically any group of people where, working together for a common purpose, and so he says that there are a number of things that neuroscience has discovered because of the way the brain works, because of the, the way that our, our brain is wired, that they can predict whether a group of people, a team, will be successful or not. And at the top of his list, this guy said this, we know that a team will be successful if the team members... If that, if that group of people have high levels of empathy. And he talked a little bit about cognitive em empathy and emotional empathy. Basically, people who, who can laugh when you laugh. People who can cry when you're crying. He says, people who truly have joy like you're getting awarded you're getting recognition and they're truly sincerely happy for you and with you he, he was talking about if you have a group of people and they can they, they have the ability not everybody's like this but if you have a group of people and they have the ability to imagine what somebody else is feeling they say neuroscience says they've discovered that if you have a team like that it's one of the signs that that team will be successful. So I think when God says, submit 
to one another out of reverence for Christ, I believe that in part what God is saying is try to understand one another. Try to love one another. Try to be patient with each other. Try to like, like hear each other out. Have a little bit of empathy. Now, of course, Jesus is our great example, right? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this. Let's put it on the screen. It says, we do not have a high priest. That's Jesus. That's our Savior. We do not have a high priest who's unable. Like, look at that next word. To what? To empathize with our weaknesses. No, we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. And so number one, how do we submit to one another? How do we love each other? First reminder is you have no idea how one kind word, how one little thing, one um, expression of love may change your friends, your coworkers' day, your spouse's day. Number two, write this down. Your spouse is facing battles you know nothing about. Your spouse is facing battles you know nothing about. Now, there is a lot of things that I share with Leah. There's a lot of things that she shares with me. We've been together for a long time. We've known each other for a long, long, long time. We actually met um, in college. I was going to Bible school. It was a Christian school. Um, she was getting her degree in elementary education. And um, we were actually headed to church. It was on a Sunday night. Long, 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 long time ago. In fact, I'll tell you how long. Let's put it on the screen. I actually had to look this up. It was on a Sunday night, September 27th, 1998. 8,729 days ago. That is a long, long time to be putting up with, to be submitted to one another. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we know each other, right? Like, we've, been, we've spent a few days to, together, right? And yet I can tell you that there are battles that she faces that I don't understand. And I can tell you there are battles that I face that she'll never understand. I mean, to the fullest extent, right? Like, I'll never really know what it feels like to be the pressures of being a pastor's wife, be living in a fishbowl when everybody's looking your way and, you know, the, 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 the difficulties of that. I, I can try to imagine, I can try to understand, but I'll never fully understand the challenges, the pressures, the difficulties. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, we don't really know to the fullest extent what that person that we love is going through. I guess what I'm saying is we're not God. Only God knows, only God is omniscient, right? Only he knows everything. So on Tuesday, <clears throat> I said, I said, honey, um, I said, I'm teaching on marriage this week, you know, uh, and I said, you know, usually any time that I teach on marriage, we get into a huge fight, okay? <clears throat> so I was like, hey, Tuesday is like my message prep day when I like really go to town and like it's a full day of like really intense thinking and uh, <clears throat> excuse me Let me get it. <clears throat> excuse me and I say honey on Tuesday uh, I'm teaching on marriage <laughs> in other words let's make sure that we don't fight this week okay it would be nice it would be nice to go to a message on Sunday without a fight uh, well that didn't happen but it's all good you know <laughs> um, so uh, I said, what, jokingly, I said, what do you want me to tell them? And she quoted Ephesians 4.32. We didn't get a chance to cover it last week. Last week we, took, we looked at Ephesians chapter 4. But Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be kind and compassionate one to another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It's a question for all of us. How kind, how compassionate are you? Number two, your spouse is facing battles you know nothing about. Number three, positive words are difficult to remember. Positive words are difficult to remember. That's just a fact of life. Negative words, they're difficult to forget. I don't know why it works like that, but that's the way it works. I need a volunteer. I need somebody that knows how to use a hammer. Can I get somebody, can I get anybody that, to come up here? Justin, would you come up here? Thank you, buddy. You guys give it up for Justin. So here's what we're going to do, all right? I'm going to put this here. You see this, this X? I want you to kind of nail this thing 
right there, okay? This wood represents a person. The nail represents negative words, okay? So please don't hit your thumb. Uh, no bad words if you miss, you know, like. <laughs> a little bit more. Oh, missed. There you go. One more. Good. Good deal. All right. Thank you, buddy. Don't go anywhere. Just stay there for a minute. Um, so, so the wood represents a person. The nail represents what? What do we say? The nail represents what? Negative, Negative words. So this is how it is in our lives. When, when somebody says something negative to you, it's like somebody grabbing a, a hammer and pan, pounding you over the head. Okay? That's how negative words are in our lives. It actually sticks too, right? Like you, you get somebody, like I can have someone um, say something positive about the way I look, about my family, about my work, you know? And that's ph phenomenal, and I appreciate it. And I think you should tell your pastor good things uh, from time to time. But I'll have one negative comment, and I will remember that one negative comment for months. Why is that? Because what we're saying, positive words are difficult to remember. Negative words are difficult to forget. Now, when, when someone says, when somebody says something that hurts you deeply, and then they take it back, like they say, man, I am so sorry. I screwed up. Please forgive me. What can happen? What happens then? Well, one of two things can happen. They may end up forgiving you or may not, right? You don't always get forgiveness. It's not always a guaranteed thing, right? Especially from human beings. But even if they're like the godliest person on earth and they forgive you, it's kind of like this. Justin, would you remove that nail? Would you remove that, please? Awesome. You're doing a fantastic, phenomenal job, man. Appreciate it, buddy. What did that leave right here? A hole. Left a little hole. Left a little mark. So when you use a negative word towards someone else, even if you ask for forgiveness later, it's always going to leave a little mark. Okay, you guys give it up for Justin real quick. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. And here's, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. If you're constantly using negative words, what you're doing is, you can't even see it, right? But there is a tiny hole. If you're constantly one negative after the next, even if you're asking for forgiveness, eventually what you end up doing is you end up damaging that person deeply. And you may ask all the forgiveness in the world, but the marks are going to stay there. And the scars are going to be there day after day after day after day. And you hit that nail, and you keep pounding that person. And eventually what it can happen is it can damage, like the wood, that person permanently. It can, if I kept going with that nail, guess what I was going to do? I was going to go through this piece of wood. And so look at what God's word says. Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless, what? Pierce. Pierce. Like a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. This leads to our fourth point. Number four, never trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. Never trust your tongue when there's junk in your heart. Like Jesus talked a lot about this. Um, he says, a good man brings good things out of the good things that are stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil that's stored up in his heart. And he says, for the mouth speaks whatever the heart is full of. And so, so it's kind of like, like this right here. Like if I squeeze this, what's going to come out? Ketchup. Not a tricky uh, question. If I, if I squeeze this, what's going to come out? Mayonnaise. And so the same way it is in, a, in our lives. When God says in Proverbs, you know, above all else, guard your heart. Guard, above, this is God speaking. This is not Alice coming up with some, no, no. This is God saying, of anything that you can do in life, the probably most important thing you can do is guard, protect your heart. Because everything that you do flows from it. 
And so, never trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. There are times when it's better to be quiet. There are times in your relationship when it's better not to say anything. Get your heart right. Hit the pause button and say like, look, Lord, I, you know where I'm at. You know what's going on. And then you can go back and you can speak up and then you can, you can, uh, you can share. But if in the heat of the moment, if you speak up and your heart is bitter, you're gonna create damage that in some cases could take years to repair. Make sense? All right, let's review real quick. You guys are doing phenomenal. Uh, you have no idea. Number one, seven reminders. You have no idea what one conversation, one word of encouragement, one expression of love, my, um, how it might change your spouse's day. Number two, your spouse is facing battles you know nothing about, regardless of how long you've been married, how long you've known her or him. Number three, positive words are difficult to remember. That's just a fact of life. Negative words are also difficult to forget. Number four, never trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. It's not good. Number five, everything you say must be true, but not everything that is true must be said. Let me say that again. Everything that you say, it's got to be true, all right? That's what God's word tells us. Everything you say has to be true, but not everything that is true must be said. Hashtag filters, okay? <laughs> so relationships are hard. Marriage, that's even harder. That's even more difficult. Anybody that tells you that, that marriage or relationship is easy, man, they don't, they're, they're lying to you. And so you are essentially, when in marriage, what you're doing is you're two, putting two imperfect people together, right? And they come from different backgrounds. They've ra been raised differently. They're used to different customs. And then you put them together. They have different preferences. And, and, and they have different you know, baggage. They have different traumas from life. And then you put them together and you say, okay, Build, build a life yeah how in the world are you going to do that well here's, here's one little thing that I've learned it takes a lot of compromise you know like it takes a, a, a whole lot of conceding like you're, you're not only is there need to be communication but there are times in your life when you have to say okay I don't necessarily like and you want to say some things and you're like you know what I'm going to bite my tongue and so how do, you, how do you know when to use a filter? Uh, the Bible says it like this in the, the Good News translation. I love this. Proverbs 16, 23. It says, intelligent people think before they speak. Yeah, I agree with that. Intelligent people think before they speak. What they say then is then more persuasive. The next verse says, kind words are like honey sweet to the taste and good for your health so uh, pastor alex when do i use the filter okay let me let me help you out real quick you know is what you're gonna say is it gonna encourage them or is it gonna embarrass them is what you're gonna say gonna hurt them or heal them everybody's hurt everybody's trying to heal a little bit from things of the past from pe things that people have said to us from you know our, our own perception and so is what you're going to say is it going to is it going to be hurtful or is it going to be is going to help heal them is it going to embarrass them and make you look better or is it going to encourage them and then here's here's one that's that's man this one gets me this one gets me is there a better way is there a better place to say it? Is there a better time to say it? The words that you choose, the, the tone, the inflection, the timing, all of it matters. Now, I, I hope that, that I'm not, I hope I haven't lost you. Everyone, listen to this. If you don't get anything else, get this. Everyone communicates. Few connect. And so, People, we think sometimes are persuaded but by what we say, but the truth is that they're not. They're not persuaded by what we say, but by, why, but by what they understand. And so you've heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? You've heard that, it's true can't lead a horse to water you can't make him drink but it's also true that you can feed him salt 
and make him thirsty, right? Pastor Alex, what are you saying? You just lost me. This is what I'm saying. Be wise. Be wise. Bible says, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Everything that you say must be true. Not everything that's true needs to actually be said. Use some filters. Be wise. Number six. You guys are doing phenomenal. Two more. We're almost done. Number six. When you serve your spouse, you're serving Christ. I really think that's the heart of what we just read earlier, right? Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. I don't see anything wrong with that verse. I think it's been taken out of context. I think it's been misused and abused for the sake of control. But the next verse, I mean, I think the stakes are just as high. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. That's a command right there. But all of that is under the umbrella of the, the previous verse, 21. Submit one another. It's mutual submission. Submit one another. Come together. You know? And so when you do these things, you're doing them as unto the Lord. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And so when you serve your spouse, really what you're doing is you're actually serving Jesus Christ. Last one, we're done. We don't always have to agree, but we can always be loving. We don't always have to agree, but we can always be loving. I've said this before, but I think it's so true. Uh, Dale Carnegie, in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, he says, you cannot win an argument. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. You cannot win an argument. Like your spouse... He's telling a story and they're to a group of people and they're into the story and they get the date wrong or they get some minor detail. You know, it was, it was uh, May, not March, you know, and, and you, uh, you know, interrupt them or have you ever seen somebody else do this? Like somebody's telling the story, you're in a group, everybody's laughing, both couples are there and as he's telling the story or she's telling the story, mid-sentence, no, that wasn't, it wasn't May, it was March. It wasn't 1997, it was 1998. Do you really think that the people listening to the story, do you think they really care that much? Yeah. No, no. And so I really believe that disagreeing doesn't really help anybody. Like arguing, I should say, wrong word. What's the point? What's the point? You know, in arguing with your spouse. And so the last point is, we don't always have to agree, but we can always be loving. Quick review and we're done. Seven reminders to help you love your spouse. Number one, you have no idea how one conversation, one word of encouragement, one expression of love might change their day. Number two, your spouse is facing battles you know nothing about. Number three, positive words are difficult to remember. Negative words are difficult to forget. Four, never trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. Five, everything you say must be true. Not everything that's true must be said. Use filters. Six, when you serve your spouse, you're serving Christ. And eight, and seven, we don't always have to agree, but we can always be loving. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what difficulties you're having relationally, in your marriage, maybe you've been through a divorce. But what I can tell you is this. You can be a little bit better. You don't have to settle. You don't have to say it's over. You know? And I don't know in what area of your life this message spoke to you but I want you to know that the mistakes of the past do not determine the future of your life the enemy is going to want to label you the enemy is going to want to say you are and then bring shame and guilt. But I want you to know, your God is greater 
that any challenge, that any difficulties that you may be going through. And so would you just pray with me? Father God, would you help us in this area of relationships, God, where there's forgiveness, God, would you help us to forgive ourselves, to forgive others. God, where there's bitterness, God, would you release that? Would you bring healing to our hearts? Where there are doubts, where there's confusion, God, I pray that you bring clarity. I pray that, I pray that your truth would overwhelm our minds and hearts, God. And I pray that we would be able to look to you as a hope of our world. And so, God, we just surrender our lives to you. And we ask that you would help us. Thank you for these seven reminders. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.